Okay, uh, let's get started. Okay, let's recap uh, last lecture. Last week we, we learned the single carrier systems and multi carrier systems. Uh, starting from the single carrier baseband system, uh, you see a simple a system with the transmit filter with the receive filter. And at the receiver, you have an equalizer because you have uh, some multi path channel. And uh, finally, you make a decision for the, uh, the transmit symbol ST. And these are the mathematics. As you see here, the ST, which is transmitted sig signal, the uh, signal will be convoluted with the transmit filter, channel, and receive filter, like this, right? And also, the noise is added through the, in the channel. This noise will also go through the receive filter in the same way. So these two are convoluted, like this way, right? So if you make these three blocks, Combine these two, combine these three, and and write it as a PT. Then we can simplify this one as this way, right? This Gaussian noise is typically white Gaussian noise. Uh, white basically means that you have, you know, ideally speaking, you have a flat power spectrum in the frequency domain. So which means that you have a power in every frequency. Uh, but this receive filter typically. Uh, the reason we have this receive filter is to uh, remove the out of band spectrum, right? Uh, any system, you are only looking at your own band, okay? The reason we have a filter here is typically to remove the out of band, so therefore the noise also will be removed for, for those out of band. Therefore, the output here, output from the receive filter, you still have a noise, but that noise is band limited because of this filter, okay? So this picture basically shows you an example. Um, this example is the case of this multipath. We have a three different path. This is an impulse response, and this is the frequency response of this channel. So you take the FFT of this, then you will get this one, right? Now then, we're thinking about two different cases depending on the symbol duration. This is the case of large symbol duration in time, which means that the in frequency domain, it is a narrow band, right? You see that this is narrow. That's my signal bandwidth. And the second case is the short symbol duration, which means that this is a high data rate, fast rate. Uh, in frequency domain, that corresponds to a wide bandwidth, right? Now that our channel is same. This one is our channel. This one, right? This one is a channel. So we have a channel bandwidth of this much uh, due to this multipath. And this narrow band uh, is my first case, first example. So compared to this channel, since my signal bandwidth is narrow, we can consider this one as almost a flat. The channel actually is a frequency selective, but within my band, since my band is narrow, we can consider this one is almost flat. That's why we call this a flat fading. We know that, right? So flat fading in frequency domain basically means that you have little ISI, inter-symbol interference in time. That's what you see here, right? The reason we have this shape, like a bell shape, is because of the, because of what? Because of transmit filter, right? When you transmit the symbol, you are not transmitting rectangle, rect rectangular symbol, right? Uh, you're making a shape. You, you are, uh, do a spectrum shaping. So that's why you have this kind of filter, this, this kind of shape through the uh, transmit filter. So this one and this one, and this is one, one, minus one. That's the symbol you are transmitting. So the red one is the original symbol. Uh, but because of this multipath, you have the green and this gray one all together, right? They are all combined. That's what you receive, right? But still, uh, you, if you um, sample here, this point, and that here point, this point, then you can recover the original symbol perfectly. But in the second case, right, because of interesting interference, uh, your symbol 
cannot be recovered only by a right sampling. What you need to do is an equalizer, right? Uh, because the, here the red one is the original one, but the green one is a reflection because of the second path, and the gray is the because of the third path, and the non-multipath of the first one is combined with the second original symbol, right? So that is a central symbol interference. So how to remove all these things is, uh, the, is to use the equalizer. Basically, equalizer will un try to undo these things, right? The, the equalizer is typically a filter, OK? So after you go through the equalizer, then this equalizer grabs all this energy and put them together like this way, right? So ideally speaking, that would be the output of the equalizer. This is the input. That's uh, what we need. Uh, that's a, you know, sim uh, the brief introduction of a single carrier system, traditional system. Now, the, these days, we see a lot of multi-carrier systems. Okay? This one shows you multi-carrier systems. In multi-carrier systems, as you see here, we have uh, several different filters, transmit filters in parallel. And at the receiver also, you have uh, receive filters in parallel. Uh, in this example, uh, G of F is a matched filter of H, right? This one is a matched filter of this one. G1 is a matched filter of G H1. So each one of these filters is independent. G1 and H, H, G0, H0 are pair. Uh, this one and this one are pair, okay? Typically, the, uh, we are assuming a frequency selective channel, like this one, for example. Uh, we have a wide range of frequency, and within this frequency, we have this kind of frequency selective channel, which means that this one is a multipath channel. We have quite a lot of multipath. Okay, that's what we are assuming. Which means that if you don't do, if you don't use this multi-carrier transmission, but you have just transmitting ST using single carrier system, like what we did before, then this channel. The channel in here, right here, um, is actually a multipath channel. So this is our channel. This is what we are trying to do. Okay? This is our case. Okay? So one way is to, to use the equalizer, like this way. That's one way, using single carrier system. But we are trying to do a better way. Okay? Instead of using a complex equalizer and using single carrier system, what we are trying to do is uh, another way. And that's another way, right? Okay. So detailed structure of multi-carrier transmission is that you have a series of information coming in, and each information now goes into encoder one by one, okay, different encoder, and each one goes to the baseband filter, and that is modulated by some frequency, and F0, F1, and all these different, all these frequencies are different, okay, each one is modulated with its own frequency. At the receiver, since we know the frequency here, here, uh, let's see. Right? Um, each one uses a different frequency, therefore you use the same frequency, carrier frequencies to recover that. And in order to, after recover, after uh, demodulating by multipl multiplying the carrier, right? Uh, here actually you have a filter, right? You have a filter, but I, this is a simplified picture. And after that, you get an equalizer. And this equalizer is only for this path, for this frequency. And this is the modul demodulation, since you've done the modulation here, right? Same way, uh, F1. Is the second is the frequency for the second path, right? So somehow the first path and second path and all these paths are independent, like this way, okay? This is a, what is actually happen. You have uh, you have these informations spread it, right? And each of them goes through the parallel processing, and eventually they are all added together. When you add it here, it's okay because each one uses a different frequency 
Therefore, you add it here. These three, three are independent, right? So they go together. After you addition, they go together. And you receive it. Again, uh, it's all mixed. But still, you multiply its own frequency. So you recover only that particular frequency, right? So the, uh, it looks like this one. This picture shows you that uh, this first path, second path, third path, all these are completely independent. Okay? That's the nice, th nice thing about the multi-carrier system. And in OFDM, what is even better is that OFDM, of course, has all the advantages of multi-carrier system because OFDM itself is a multi-carrier system. But in addition to the nice thing, like a multiple parallel path, well, what is the additional thing in OFDM is that when you choose, when you select the, these frequencies, F0, F1, uh, right, Fn minus 1, these frequencies have these, these relationships. Okay? In, the, in any multi-carrier system, you can, you can have a different frequencies for each, each of these sub-carrier. Then it's a multi-carrier system because we are using multiple carriers. Right? Generally, that's a multi-carrier system. But in this OFDM system, it's, it is a special case of multi-carrier system. Okay? What is special is that the, these, each of these frequencies have this relationship. So what is this relationship? This relationship basically means that there is a reference frequency, and all the other frequencies are multiple of this frequency. Once you do that, then we know that the orthogonality between these frequencies are guaranteed. Okay? Orthogonalities are guaranteed. Why do you want to have orthogonality right here? Think about this way. Let's say we have two different frequencies, only two. Okay? Just simplify the scenario. Only two. Right here, we are going to add it together, right? So whatever we have here, let's call this A. Here, B, simply. A multiply with the cosine F0. B multiply with cosine F1, right? We are going to add it together. Right here, A cosine F0 plus B cosine F1. That is transmitted. At the receiver, what we are going to do is that we are going to multiply cosine F0 again, right? Let me see. Simply, simply speaking, This is what we transmitted right here, right? In the channel, simply speaking, right? And what we're going to do is that at the receiver, now you're going to multiply cosine F0 again. And also, you have this one, and you are going to multiply cosine F1 again, right here. The first equation is this one. This one is the second equation, right? So based on the receive symbol, now you're going to multiply cosine F0. You're going to also multiply cosine F1 to recover the first one and second one. So our goal is that when you multiply this, you want to recover A from this. You want to recover B from this. Right? That's our goal. So let's do that. Right here, once you do it, right? A cosine F0, cosine square F0 T plus B cosine F0 t cosine F1 t. Same way here. Um, A cosine F0 cosine F1 plus B square cosine B cosine square F1. Something like this, right? Uh, by the trigonometric identity, you know that this one um, becomes like this, right? Okay, this one is same as this one. Same way. This one is same as the same way. So in this case, right, you have a gain, but uh, we just ignore the gain. Now we cover the DC, but we have additional term, 2F0. How, how can you remove this one? Filter. By filter. That's why you need a filter. Okay? 
yeah, I, you know, I simplified this, but you will have a filter. That filter is your band pass filter, uh, the low pass filter, okay, to remove this band. This is, a, this is called a harmonic, right? This is your own frequency, uh, multiple of frequency, like a 2F0, 3F0, that's called the harmonics, right? You want to remove the harmonic. Whenever you, do, you, know, whenever you uh, multiply the frequency, okay, in hardware-wise, this multiplication is called the mixer. Okay, that's one of the RF component. You have a mixers. Whenever you do a mixers, which means that whenever you multiply two different frequencies, always you have a filter, okay? Because of this harmonics. When you multiply two different frequencies, there will be harmonic every time. So by the filter, this is gone, okay? What about this one? You want to remove this one also, right? We also have to remove this one. In order to remove this one, you have to think about a certain relationship between these two. Okay? Same way here. Uh, you want to um, remove this one in the same way, and this one also has to be gone. This one also, like this way. So we want to have only this one, this one. That's what we want to do, right? So therefore, uh, we want to have a filter here, and we also want to have some special relationship between the frequencies. And this OFDM has that uh, relationship, you know, the orthogonality between these frequencies, okay? So suppose that this is what you transmitted. This is a transmi transmitted um, signals in the frequency domain. And this is our channel, uh, some frequency selective channel. When you transmit this signal through the channel like this, then this is what you receive, right? Some channel, some frequency, you have good channel gain. Some other frequency, you have low channel gain, like this way, right? Um, so this is what you receive, but uh, what you want to do after this is equalizer in order to recover this one to this way, okay? After you go through the equalizer, we want to get this way. But in this case, the each equalizer, each of them, right? As you see in this picture, each of these paths is independent, okay? Which means that in frequency domain, each of these subcarrier is independent, okay? So this first equalizer only take care of the first one. Second equalizer only worry about the second one, okay? So each equalizer just worry about its own subcarrier. So simply speaking, uh, the first subcarrier it looks pretty good. So equal, this equalizer multiply a small, uh, some, uh, some small, uh, some like a some gain, some like a unit gain, for example. Like a third subcarrier, like this, right? This one is small. So the third equalizer has to multiply a little bit larger gain in order to recover this one to this way. Okay. That's what we want to do. So the each equalizer is very simple, okay? You want to recover this one into this one. That's all you have to do for each of the equalizer. Yeah. Why do you change those uh, multiples of the frequency? You can't get this formula even without the multiple frequency. Like F0 is not a multiple of F1. Uh -huh. You still can uh, demodulate in that one. Yeah, uh, F0, F1, I think this one, um, it's nothing to do with the, this relationship, right? You are, not, you are yeah. asking about this relationship, right? This filter is nothing to do with that. You can remove this one, and you, have, uh, you can recover this one. What about this one? What about this part, this pack? This one, you want to remove it. Oh, I see. What you're saying is that as long as uh, F0, F1 is the separate enough, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. That's a, that's a traditional, say, traditional multi-carrier system. Yeah, that's right. So F0, F1 is a uh, separate enough, um, like this way, right, for example. Then uh, you can guarantee that this one does not interfere the other one, so you can do it. But the nice thing about this one, this relationship, this relationship in the OFDM is that, as you see here, um, we want to use the spectrum more efficiently, right? That's a fundamental, that's all interrelated. But in this case, 
Uh, it is multi-carrier, but you still have to guarantee a certain guard band. Uh, that's we, we really want to avoid. Right? In OFDM, by taking a this relationship, <coughs> what is guaranteed is that um, you can actually have an overlap like this way. Right? This picture actually is a simple the, the, um, the simplified picture, but uh, if you look at the, any other OFDM books, then what you will see is that you will see a single function. So for example, right, the F0 is the main, uh, is the subcarrier for the main beam, and you will see a sync function like this. And you will see another sync function like this, another sync function. So each of them will make a sync function like this, okay, next to each other. And this spectrum is the addition of all the sync functions. Okay, that's what, what has happened. In that case, what happened is that as long as uh, you have the exact frequency offset, which means that as long as you take the exact frequency, this frequency in practice, right, in actual system, this frequency may not exactly 100% same as this frequency. You always you have a frequency offset, some of the practical uh, hardware, some limitations and things like that, right? So there can be a little bit offset, but as long as, ideally speaking, as if the, these two are same, these two are exactly same, that means that you are doing a sampling and you're you know, taking the subcarrier right here exactly. In that case, think about the sync function. For th think about the sync function right here. You have a sync function right here, then you have a maximum at F0. And you have zero in every F0, F2, F3 point, right? Look at the sync function. Do you see what I'm saying? That's what the, that's the nice thing about sync function, right? Let me throw it here. You have F0 here. F1, F2, F3. You have a sync function for this one, but that sync function looks like this. You make another sync function right here. That sync function looks like this. Another sync function like this. Okay? It's like this. So for that sync function, you have a maximum at F0, but you have a zero in every F1, F2, F3. It's all, it's, you have a zero crossing for every F, every multiple of F. That's why we select the multiple of F0, right? Let's think about the sync function with F1. Uh, it will have a maximum in F1, right? And you have a zero crossing in the multiple of them. F2, F3, you have zero. So therefore, if you can select this frequency exactly, this frequency and this frequency and this frequency, then you have a maximum here, and the impact of all the other sync frequency, sync function will go to zero here. This one goes to zero, that one also goes to zero at this point, okay? So that does not interfere. That's a nice thing about the OFDM. In this case, right, the earlier multi-carrier systems, even though you have enough guard band here, maybe there may be a little bit of a leak, okay? Still, there may be interference. It's not guaranteed. And not only that, you have uh, enough guard band, which is a waste, okay? So this is the most efficient way. As long as F0 and this F0 are exactly the same, that's the condition, assumption, Right? As long as that assumption is true, this is the most efficient way. Okay? Yeah. So remember that sync function uh, concept. Uh, that's uh, one of the fundamental things in OFT. Yeah. Not efficient? Oh, yeah, 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 that's, that's, uh, yeah, uh, I need to correct that. That should be k plus 1. But uh, the intention, my intention to show this one is that all the other frequencies are multiple of F0. That's what I was trying to mention, okay? Um, there was a little bit of mistake in the equation, but uh, that, that was my intention, okay? Okay, yeah. Where, where should what? The filter. Here. Here, but uh, why does D 
demodulation block afterwards when you, we are multiplying the frequency at the start? When you are multiplying at the start? Demodulation is actually multiplying the frequency with that thing, with the carrier frequency. F0 is being multiplied at the first instant, at the receiving end. Uh, say that again. I didn't understand the question. The demodulation, why the demodulation is here, yeah. you're saying? When we are multiplying the carrier frequency at the start. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So demodulation is actually multiplying with the carrier frequency, right? Ah, I see. I see your question. Okay. Let's talk about modulation and demodulation a little bit, right? Okay. Um, that's actually nothing to do with this picture. Okay. That's a general question. So the... When you see the modulation, right? The terminology modulation uh, appears in several different places. One place is the frequency modulation. Like, uh, for example, um, you have some spectrum or baseband system. Ba you have some bandwidth at the baseband. Here, all this is a baseband system. You know what baseband means, right? Baseband. Baseband basically means that you are dealing with the, uh, all the bandwidth and frequency right here, around the zero, right? Around the DC. That's the uh, baseband. Once you do this all processing, like a signal processing and modulation, dismodulation, demodulation, equalizer, all these baseband, after you do all this baseband processing, eventually, at the end, you are doing you are loading this one into a carrier, right? Because you are given a certain frequency to transmit your signal. Like for example, your cell phone uses 1.8 gigahertz, okay? So you do all this modulation, and all this basement processing. Last, at the last step, you are multiplying that particular carrier frequency to transmit through the antenna, right? So that thing, the carrier modulation, that's the last thing. So let's say this is the, uh, the baseband signal. You've done all these things, right? At the last step, what we're going to do is that, let's say this is, a, this is a signal. This signal comes in. This is a baseband signal. At the last stage, you want to multiply your carrier frequency. So for example, like a cosine FCT. In that case, the output, this is the input. And the output, you have a modulation, right? This is F0, FC, that is shifted here, right? That's called the carrier, carrier modulation or sometimes frequency modulation or just modulation, right? This modulation, the purpose is to uh, put your bandwidth or signal into the right frequency. This is called modulation. This, this is modulation, this is demodulation, right? right? That's what we've done. But this modulation, yeah, I know this is a little bit maybe uh, confusing, but this modulation is a little bit different. This is, a, a, that, this is not that modulation. This modulation, this mode and D mode is the uh, symbol modulation, like a QPSK, BPSK, or 16 quam. Okay? That particular modulation, the purpose is to transform your symbol, which is bits, into the, another symbol, which are suitable for the channel. You cannot transmit the bits over the channel, right? Okay, simply that's, uh, if you do that, I mean, you can do it practically. If you do it, then your bits will die away with the, right away, right? You cannot deliver the bits as it is. I mean, technically you can do it, but, uh, so therefore you are gonna transform this information, originally bit, into the symbols, right? Complex value. So simply you have a bit, you have a complex bit, complex symbols right here. That's the modulation I'm talking about. And what you're talking about, the modulation, the carrier, the frequency modulation is this one, this part. And that's part, demodulation. Okay? But that's, uh, that's something else, another symbol modulation. Okay. Um, so far, we looked at the time domain view, and this is uh, the frequency domain view, and this is a time domain view. In time domain, uh, what is important to remember is that the original symbol duration, original symbol, even before this one, original symbol duration is short because we are talking about the high data rate system. Okay? High data rate system, the symbol duration is short, but when you go through this 
uh, multi-carrier system, you are actually using, you are using a multiple carriers in parallel. Therefore, you, you have a multiple uh, short duration, short symbols in, in, in series, you're going to put it into the parallel. The first symbol goes to the first path. Second symbol goes to the second path. Something like that, right? That's why we need the serial to parallel converter, right? Once you do that, right, what is important here is that the total symbol duration does not change. What does it mean? Okay, here again, um, there can be a little bit confusing because we, some people use a symbol in uh, many different places. Let me clear here. Um, we have OFM symbol uh, in another context in wireless communications. Let's say you're talking about CDMA system or any other single carrier systems. Uh, what is the definition of symbol? Symbol typically is defined by uh, one information unit right here after the modulation, symbol modulation, right? You have, let's say, two bits coming in, two bits, and you do the QPSK modulation, you get one symbol. Something like that, right? That's typically the definition of symbol in conventional system. Okay? That's, that's how they define the symbol. However, in OFDM system, typically, some people still do that, but I believe that's the probably bad practice. The more, the better way in OFDM, typically, is that in OFDM, we call the, the whole OFDM symbol as a symbol, okay? But still, in this case, you are still using the bits, you're still doing a QPSK modulation, right? Then how do we call this one? In this case also, right, you have two bits coming in into QPSK, those two bits will be converted into a one complex value. But in conventional system, that complex value is called symbol, but what do you want to call this one in OFDM system. If you want to call this one as a symbol, same way, then this is a little bit confusing because we call this one as a symbol, okay? So that's why I like to call this one as a sample, okay? Sample, uh, okay? That's uh, what I left clear. This one is a sample here. Uh, we have N. This is, there are num the number of dif the parallel paths is N. We have N different symbols. Uh, the samples, frequency samples, okay? We have n different frequency samples and collect the n samples, put it into the IFFT in order to get another time domain n samples, okay? Put those n samples like this. We have n samples right here. That's why here you see the samples here, right? And you collect the n different samples, right, to construct one OFDM symbol. And in OFDM system, this OFDM symbol is the basic unit. This is what is transmitted through the channel. Okay? But inside, this, inside of this uh, uh, OFDM symbol, you have n different samples. Okay? n different samples. Okay? But what I just said is that the symbol duration does not change in OFDM. Okay? What does it mean is that this symbol duration, like OFM symbol duration, which is T0, right? This one does not change. This one was a T0, and originally, coming here, originally, you have bits, right? You have original bits. N bits, I mean, in this case, I'm using, I'm, I'm assuming a BPSK for here, symbol modulation. Uh, you have N bits, right? That way, these N bits are converted to N samples right here in complex samples, right? The, these n bits, original here, n bits, have the duration of T0, okay? These n bits have the duration of T0. Eventually, these goes into uh, BPSK modulation and convert it to the complex samples, the frequency samples, and go through the IFFT, and you get eventually these n samples which construct the symbol. Still, the, this, the symbol duration is T0. This one was the T0, after all this process, the symbol duration is still T0. But uh, what you can see now is that in this case, right, in the original um, symbols, original bits, this is the frequency domain. Each of these bits now goes to each of these different paths, go through all these things, and after IFT, now you are in the time domain, right? But you have still have the same 
uh, symbol duration, which means that for each of that, each of these information uh, in frequency domain has only tiny symbol, right? Like, uh, like uh, this symbol is a T0. So therefore, for each one, right? Just one, one bit, you have a T of TB time, right? The bit duration is only this tiny, TB. But this TB is now expanded into T0 because uh, this bit energy, original bit energy in frequency domain is now spread it over all this T0 symbol because this is time domain symbol. We were in the frequency domain bits right here. You see what I'm, you see what I'm saying? Since we are going uh, from the frequency domain to the time domain, the energy in here is spread over all this uh, freak, the time symbol and samples. And this, simple, this sample right here, the energy is spread over all this. Okay? That's what happened in IFFT and also FFT. Right? Same thing happens. In FFT at the receiver, you receive this time domain samples or one OFDM symbol, right? And these samples now go into FFT and you get uh, N output samples, which is a frequency domain sample. And each of these samples basically collects all the spread energy back, okay? And recover this one. That's how things work. Each of these energy is now spread it and then again despread it and come back to this one. That's how things work, right? So in time-wise, the each original one has only this small bit duration. That bit, dura bit duration is now spread it, which means that your symbol duration is now expanded. Originally it was only TB, but now it's a T0. And then come back to this one, okay? Because of this uh, time expansion, now the channel here, channel for each independent path, channel becomes now uh, frequency flat. Originally with the TB, okay, TB symbol duration or t uh, bit duration, it was a frequency selective, but now this TB is uh, in time domain, the TB is now expanded into T0 through the channel. When you go through the channel, now uh, this one becomes a frequency flat. Okay? Uh, this picture shows you the full picture of OFDM. Okay, so let me skip this one. And this one also we looked at uh, last week, right? In, uh, in case of OFDM A, which is an ex ex uh, extension of OFDM, <coughs> what we do is that uh, we uh, allocate different subcarriers for different users. We have N different subcarriers, but user one use uh, some subcarriers, not all of them, but some of them. And user two use another subcarriers, right? Which is not used by user one. So the, each subcarrier is used only by one user, of course. Two users cannot use the same subcarrier, right? In that case, there will be collision, right? So that kind of, you know, who's gonna use this frequency and things like that, that will be managed by scheduler. So there will be scheduler. For every multiple access system, every multi-user system will have a scheduler, which is actually the topic of today, right? After this brief uh, you know, introduction, brief review, we're gonna talk about scheduler. But the scheduler is involved. Scheduler will tell the, each user that, okay, user one, you can use this, this, this subcarrier, and user two, you can use another subcarrier like this, okay? That's the uh, scheduler, and that's how things work. And the user one signal like this, user two use another subcarrier that are merged through the channel. That's what you receive uh, in the receiver. Okay. We also talked about the single carrier FDMA, right? Remember that what was the intention? Why we do we even think about this single carrier FDMA? Uh, the reason was that was the was the peak to average power ratio, right? That was the biggest problem of OFDM technology. Okay, so in order to avoid PAPR problem, the single carrier FDMA uh, is trying to put additional DFT. So if you remove this DFT block and think about the others, then it is identical to F the OFDM system. In single carrier FDMA, 
Only difference is that we have additional block called the DFT. That's why we call this a DFT spread it OFT. Why do we call this a DFT spread it? Again, the reason is DFT is the same as FFT. Uh, DFT is trying to convert the uh, time domain symbols to the frequency domain symbols. But when you uh, move from one domain to another domain, let's like uh, you were in the time domain and you are going to frequency domain, then it's not like one-to-one -one mapping, right? What is happening when you convert the one domain to another is that you have, in this case, for example, right? You have G0, G1, GL minus one symbols in time domain. Each of these time domain symbol energy is now spread it over all this frequency. This G1 is, the energy in G1 is spread it over all this frequency, right? Each one is spread it, each one is spread it like this. Typically, that's what's happening. If you think about the structure of the FFT and DFT, right? Think about the structure. You learn the, you know, uh, what this FFT looks like, right? In the maybe DSP course or something like that, right? Think about the structure. Then you know that the, each of these energies spread it, basically. Same way here, IFFT. I mean, internally, these are identical, right? That's why I call this a DFT spread it, OFDM, because you are, you know, spreading um, before the OFDM, you are basically spreading by DFT. Okay? And uh, in DFT, in synchronous FDMA, what is noticeable is the DFT size is much smaller than IFFT. IFFT, this block, has the same size as the total number of subcarriers available in the system, but in DFT, has the si same size as, as your allocation. You are not going to use the total subcarriers because you are not. Uh, the only user, okay? Uh, so the scheduler will tell you that, okay, you can use maybe five different subcarriers, okay? Okay, scheduler will tell you. In that case, this DFT has a size of five, okay? Which means that this size in hardware, this DFT size can vary, okay? Sometimes when, when I'm in a good condition, I maybe, I can maybe use uh, like 10 subcarriers. A little bit later in time, Maybe scheduler may tell you, tell me that, okay, now, why don't you use only five subcarriers now? Okay, then I can reduce the size. So hardware-wise, this one has to have a flexible size because the size of this one uh, is determined by the number of subcarriers assigned to you. Okay, so this one basically changes. But this one is much, much smaller than I-50. So there, therefore, you have to have a zero padding Okay, in order to um, cover the size. That's why we need the subcare mapping. So how to map depends on two different things. First thing is a localized mapping and another is a distributed mapping. Localized mapping is that uh, whenever you have a five subcarriers for mapping, those five carriers are uh, collocated. They're all uh, next to each other and the, the remaining are all zeros. Which, this is what happened in the um, in, in the frequency domain, once you do zero padding in the frequency domain, that corresponds to an interpolation in time domain. I mean, signal processing, right? So in the, that is a time domain. Zero padding uh, means this interpolation. But in this case, you are doing zero insertion, okay? You basically uh, distribute each of them in an in a equal distance, okay? This one is a zero padding in frequency which is interpolation in time. This one is a zero insertion in frequency, which corresponds to repetition in time. Okay, okay uh, this is a today's topic. Uh, today we are going to talk about the multi-user scheduling. Okay, since we are talking about the multi-user system, this, uh, uh, we want to learn the, what is the scheduling. So simply, uh, let's start from the basic, um, let's say, definition of scheduling. What is scheduling? Scheduling is how to allocate or how to assign um, those users and how to allocate the given resources to those users. We have uh, multiple users in this scenario, okay? More than one users. Since the more than one users, are requesting some resources, like, oh, okay, I'd like to transmit some data and give me some subcarriers, give me some time slot, things like this, right? So each one 
uh, is requesting some resource. It is a scheduler's job in order to see you know, who is going to get what. Okay? So that's the uh, that's a scheduler, scheduling. So we have uh, resources such as a time, frequency, space, and etc. There are many other uh, resources possible. <coughs> um, then what is the criteria? Okay, scheduler wants to select users. Let's say, um, you know, whether we are thinking the time as the resource or the frequency as a resource, that depends on the system. If we think about the TDMA type of system, then I'm talking about the time as a resource. But if we, if we talk about the OFDMA system, then frequency would be the resource. Okay? But, any, but any system, uh, but, any, but you know, anything, we still have the same um, scheduler concept. So the, what is the criteria for scheduler? Of course, a scheduler wants to choose the best user. I mean, the, typically, right? So think about this one. So I'm the manager, okay? I have five different, um, five different pe people working for me, okay? My job as a manager is to schedule, okay? Is to assign jobs to those five, five uh, people, right? I have this much of job. What I need to do is I have to allocate this much of job to those five users, five, five people. What is the criteria? What do you want to do? Your goal, probably, in this case, is to maximize the job done, right? You want to finish more jobs. That's probably your goal, okay, as a manager, right? As a manager, definitely, you don't want to finish the less amount of job, right? So let's say that's a, that corresponds to the capacity right here. So generally, the, the main goal, main and prime goal of the, of the scheduler is to maximize the capacity. Okay, I like to finish the more jobs, maximum amount of job. Okay, we have a five different people. We want to you know, finish the more jobs. Okay. Okay, then how can you do it? That's uh, the selection cr criteria comes in. So I like to finish more jobs. Um, how can you do it? As a manager, simply, I mean, think about that. And you are a manager, how can you achieve that goal? That's the question, right? That's the question. So let's uh, think about uh, one by one. We think about, thought we um, talked about TDMS system and OFDMS system. There are many other systems, but these two are the typical examples. In TDMS system, we have a concept called the time slot. Okay, time slot is the minimum scheduling unit. You have a series of time slot in a frame. Okay, in the frame structure, you have uh, many time slots. And each time slot is independent. And for each time slot, you're going to assign only one user. Okay? Maybe the first user takes the first time slot. Another, maybe second user takes the second time slot. Things like that. Okay? We're, we're going to choose only one user per time slot. Okay? That's the TDMA. Now the question is, which, which user I'm going to select for each time slot? That's the question to be answered right? in this type of uh, scheduling system. Now in OFDMA system, in the OFDMA, as we see earlier in this picture, right? Who, which user is going to use which subcarrier? That is the question now, okay? Maybe user one can use the first subcarrier, but maybe user two you can use the first subcarrier. So who should use the which subcarrier? That is the question, okay? For the sub, sub for the scheduler, okay? So let's find out a uh, little bit more detail about this. So this picture shows you a simple picture, simple scenario of TDMA systems. We have four different users. Okay? Maybe one user is very far away. Okay? Another user maybe is pretty close to the base station. And the scheduler is always here in the base station. Not always, but I'm assuming in this case that scheduler is, is with the base station. That's my ass assumption here. Okay? Here we have a um, scheduler right here. And also, 
we have to make a one, one more assumption. The assumption here is that uh, there are full of data waiting to be delivered for every user. Okay, every user. User one has this much of data to transmit, I mean to receive. So the, these, these data are inside the base station. Maybe someone else out there is trying to deliver the data to the user one, and that data is waiting here. Okay? This, these are the data for each user to receive. Okay? I'm talking about only the downlink case in this case. Okay? So we are, the base station is transmitting. Okay? So these, they, th these data are to be received by the users. Now then, okay, each user has a full amount of data. This, is, this case, this is called the backlogged. Okay? Back, uh, basically, I'm assuming that backlogged uh, users, okay, backlogged. That's what what it means. Backlogged. Okay. In that case, now the it is up to the scheduler. Since this is a time the the TDMA system, this is a um, the time slot structure. We have a frame structure. We have a seven different time slots. Okay. These these are the uh, number of time slots, and this are this is the what the frame structure looks like. We have a, um, actually this one is the animation, so let me go to that one. Okay. We have uh, seven different time slots in the frame structure in time, right? This one is a first time slot, second time slot, and so on. We have seven different time slots, and now the, uh, in scheduler, we want to select which, which user to transmit first. Okay? For each time slot, we are going to select only one user. Okay? So now, the, how can you choose? Okay? That's the question. As an example, maybe for time slot 1, we can transmit uh, user 4 data. Just an example. And maybe in time slot 2, another user, maybe user 1. Next, user 3. Next, user four again. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about later why you want to um, transmit four again. I mean, I mean uh, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but this is just an example. And next, user two, user one, user three, like this. Okay? So for each time slot, you're going to select only one user. Okay? So now, um, you know, we'll see the details how to choose a user. Simply speaking, right? How would you choose user for each time slot? Think about this. Maybe the, the most simple way, simplest way is to do called round robin. Right? What is round robin? Take turns. Yeah, just take turns simply, right? User four, three, two, one, four, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, like this way, right? That's probably the um, simple way, simplest. Okay, we'll we'll talk about those things uh, in a minute, but this is what the, this is the whole scenario that we are going to talk about. So look at the uh, system model a little bit. Okay, we have uh, three different users right here, and this is the base station. Inside the base station, we have a scheduler like this, and inside the scheduler, we have a data like this one: user one data, user two, user three. These data data are waiting to be transmitted. And scheduler will basically take um, and select one after another and transmit through here. And then receiver and each, each user it receives it. And of course, you do the channel estimation and blah, blah, and recover uh, the original uh, user one data, user two data, user three data, things like that. OK, uh, there are several parameters to consider in scheduling. First of all, Channel condition per time slot. Why do you need this? Why do you want to consider this one? Channel condition per time slot for each user. Or sometimes even per subcarrier. Then let's go back to, in order to answer that question, let's go back to this picture. OK, we have uh, four different users. Which user do you want to select, do you want to transmit first? Or maybe I would say, which user uh, 
Suppose that we want to consider the users unevenly. I mean, suppose that's the case. Okay. Then which which user do you want to transmit? Which which user do you want to consider more? I mean, which user should should get the higher weight? Because user four has the better channel quality. Because simply because this one is uh, close enough, right? User of two is very far away, okay? So even though this guy, the base station, transmits some data, maybe it's uh, too weak that to be delivered, right? So you need to consider the channel condition, okay? Channel condition. This channel condition is, okay, let me illustrate this way. Going back to the manager example, I have a man I, I'm a manager, right? I have uh, five different people working for me. Okay, when I allocate the job for each user, right? What what kind of thing should I consider? Performance, yeah. So let's say user one, let's say user four, has a very excellent performance. Okay, if I give him this much of job, he'll finish it right away. User two is very slow. Okay, user second guy is very very slow. So my goal as a manager is to finish as many jobs as possible. Then how would you assign? Of course, you're going to give up all the jobs to this guy, right? Everything for you. All the other guys just relax. That's the maximum way, in fact. OK? Definitely, that's a temporary solution, of course, right? But uh, that's, the, that's what I'm saying. The channel condition corresponds to such things, performance, right? So typically, this one has a better, best channel quality among these. So therefore, uh, I can maximize the capacity by allocating more, uh, more illustrations to him. If, if not all, but more. Okay. So channel condition is uh, the number one parameters to consider. Per time slot. Why do we say per time slot? Because the channel is varying. We are talking about the fading channel, right? Even though this is the case, considering the fading channel, uh, generally, right? Generally, in average, long term average, this guy has a better condition than the other in, in long term average. However, since the, we are talking about the fading channel for each of them, and a certain instant, maybe this is worse than this one, right? Suddenly, this one has the deep fading, and this guy, at that moment, this guy has a suddenly good channel condition, right? The channel basically vary. So therefore, each time slot, you may have a different condition. Maybe this guy is better than the other, but suddenly, um, accidentally, this guy is better than all the other. Okay? So because of that, we need to look at the channel condition per time slot. Same thing can happen per subcarrier. Think about OFDM system, right? Uh, we are talking about the frequency selective channel. So therefore, the each subcarrier, you have a different channel gain. Okay? So therefore, we'll look at the picture in the next slide. So you need to uh, measure the channel condition. You need to know the channel condition per time slot, per sub carrier for each user. Second thing, priority for each user. Why do you want to consider this one? Different priority. Yeah, the, that's a part of the priority, yes. Maybe you know, one kind of definition priority. What would be the other priority for each user? How do you define the importance here? Um, yeah, that, that's exactly. I mean, for example, medical, uh, some, uh, I mean, just for example. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Actually, that's uh, almost in the same category as uh, what he said. Um, that's true. Maybe some, inf some information is more important than the other, right? Um, so that's a priority. Another probably possible pr priority is that something like this. Um, maybe this guy, even though this guy is far away, this guy is paying $1,000 per month. This guy pay only $10. $10. Then who would you consider more? Right? Uh, that could be a priority. Super user, right? Or some VIP user, whatever it is, right? 
I mean, the, you can define priority in a many different ways. As he said, right, uh, maybe this is a data traffic, this is a voice traffic. Typically, voice traffic has a low priority, okay, generally. I mean, so that all considered in scheduler. Queue length of each user. Why should we consider this one? Going back to this picture, I, I, I assume the backlogged scenario, right? Which means that we have infinite number of, infinite size of queue and uh, infinite uh, of data is waiting. But that's actually not true in practice, right? So let's say we are thinking about a very simple round robin type system. Let's say you take one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, like for each of the carry, each of the time slot, you just do a, a take turns, round robin. Suddenly, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and empty, the queue is empty, nothing to transmit. In that case, what happened? You are wasting one time slot. So therefore, the queue length has to be considered. When you, even though you do a round robin or any other scheduler, right? You have to estimate when you switch to another user, then you have to look at the queue length a priori, okay? You have to, some data to be transmitted. That way it's, meaning, uh, it's meaningful to switch to that user, right? If uh, some user has nothing to transmit, then what's the point of switching to that user, right? <clears throat> so Q length definitely should be considered. Uh, this is also um, another parameter which makes a complex, which makes a scheduler too complex. Minimum data rate for each user. That's also part of the priority that uh, he mentioned. Maybe this user three wants to guarantee that uh, my data rate, received data rate is like a 10 kilo BPS. Okay, something like that. Okay, maybe user four, high paying user. Since I paying $1,000 a month, I want one mega BPS every single point, every single minute, okay? Maybe that's, uh, you know, that's the minimum data rate. So each user may have its own data, minimum data rate. So you need to satisfy that, okay? So that is a very strict uh, condition, very strict criteria. So therefore the scheduler has to consider all that. So these four different, actually there are some more, these parameters, all these parameters makes a scheduler to be very, very complex. Very complex. Okay? But goal is simple. You want to select one user here. You want to select another user here. Okay? That's the final goal. But how to select? Based on what? What is the selection criteria? That is a function of all these parameters. So now let's look at the TDM system a little bit more. Here are the TDMS systems. So we see a time here, and you see a, some broken line here. This one is a time slot. We have a bunch of time slot here. In this example, as you see here, we have a three different users. User one, user two, user three. These three users are sep uh, separate with a different distance. Okay, this is H1 and H2, H3. Okay. And uh, we're talking about the fading channel. Therefore, uh, let's say, User one, which is a blue, it has this time variation, fading channel. Green has its own fading channel. Red has its own. So in other words here is that this is a very important assumption. What is the assumption? important assumption here is that every user experiences an independent fading statistics, which is true generally, right? Because uh, there's no correlation. They are separated enough in time, in, this, in, in, this, in space, right? Um, they experience an independent fading. Now, given that, you are the scheduler. You are the designer of the scheduler. How would you choose the user? I mean, given that, uh, given that each user has a fading channel, and given that the, you know, all those users have independent fading statistics, how would you choose it? What you want to do is that you probably want to look at all these channel variations, okay? Look at the, the whole picture of this, okay? Suppose that scheduler knows the whole picture of this, then scheduler will choose the red one in this time slot because he's the best one, okay, for this time slot. Next time slot, same way. I know these three and compare these three. Red one is the best one, so I'll choose the red one. What about the, this time slot? Compared to these three, blue one is the best, so I'll choose the best one. 
Okay? Every time I choose the best one, like this. Okay? That's one thing. That's one of the scheduler called the maximum SNR scheduler. Or it's called opportunistic scheduling. Okay? You'll probably hear this one many times. But opportunistic scheduling is the same as maximum SNR scheduling. Uh, in this scheduling, we are, you are going to choose the user with the maximum SNR. Because he's the, simply he's the best one. Okay? In the manager example, right? Let me go back to manager example. I thought the user, in this case, right? I thought the user 3 is the best performing guy. I mean, generally, on long term average, that is true. I mean, long term average, let's take the average of all these three. In average, user 3 is the best performing guy. That is true. But his performance actually is sometimes low, sometimes good. Like, uh, he, his characteristics, like uh, his temperament. You, you see what I'm saying, right? He basically sometimes angry, sometimes, you know, cool, like this. He, he changes every time. In the same way, the others also, right? Everyone has a different mood. For today, I'm feeling good, but tomorrow, you know, I'm very angry, things like that. So depending on the mood, your performance varies. In that case, as a manager, what should I do? Every day, I have to find out what is the mood for him, him, for today, right? Right? And I have to decide, okay, this guy seems to be in good mood today. Okay, maybe all of the job for him, right? Something like that. That's this one, right? It changes, basically. So therefore, every time slot, I have to choose the best guy. Okay? I'm talking about one type of scheduler called opportunistic scheduling, okay? There are many other ways. Uh, let's think about the OFDMA system right here. OFDMA system, uh, actually this is, no, this is wrong. Okay, going to the OFDMA system. This is the OFDMA system. In OFDMA, uh, you have uh, subcarriers in frequency domain. Okay, this is a frequency domain. This is a time domain. In frequency domain, you have subcarriers like this. And since we are talking about the frequency selective channel, the transfer function, the frequency response of the channel actually changes depending on the frequency. Maybe certain frequency, certain subcarriers, you have a good, look at the red one, but some other subcarriers, you have a bad channel, okay? And uh, we have the same assumption. The, every user have independent, has independent channel condition. But in, even in OFDM system, you have a concept of time slot. It's not exactly called the time slot, but there is a some time um, slot type of concept still there, okay? Because you are not continuous, you are not doing continuous transmission, okay? There's no system doing continuous transmission. You are doing a transmission over a certain period, and the next period, uh, maybe some other users doing, or you can also do again, okay? Things like that. So there's a still concept of time slot. So you know, certain time slot at some time. At, at this instant, for example, you have these variations, channel variations over the channel. In that case, let's say you are the scheduler. How would you select users? Basically, same way. These subcarriers, from subcarrier 1 to subcarrier 5, for example, you're going to choose the red user. Okay? For this subcarrier, choose blue one. Something like that, right? Uh, for, from here to here, you're going to select the blue user, okay? So that's how you allocate the subcarriers to each user, okay? Now, what happened is, this was the condition, channel condition, at this time. Now the time changes, okay? Time changes, and we, let's uh, move to two time slot later. After two time slot, channel changes. Of course, everyone, for everyone, right? Now we have a totally different scenario, okay? At that time, uh, you have to recalculate again, okay? Now the channel condition completely changes, and now we see that from this to this subcarriers, it was the red one earlier, but now it is blue. Blue is the better, better one, right? 
and green sometimes, right? So channel condition basically changes over frequency, changes over time. So therefore, the scheduler has to know that, has to know that who, who is the best user for which subcarrier for which time, okay? So the, um, right? So different channel state per time slot, per subcarrier, per user. Simply speaking, there are so many information here, right? Uh, scheduler has to know channel state for all these things, so there are too many informations, too many channel state informations. That's why in practical systems, uh, in, especially in OFDMA based practical systems, they're doing subcarrier grouping. Uh, it is very difficult to deal with each subcarriers independently, therefore you make uh, some group of subcarriers, okay? Like uh, maybe in, in actually in LTE system, you make 12, 12 subcarriers as a group. Okay? Just 12 subcarriers uh, is a one group, so they consider as just one identity, one, one, ent one uh, entity. Okay? Even though there is a channel variation within 12 subcarriers, that's ignored. You just average it over these 12 subcarriers, and we assign, we just look at only one channel condition for that 12 subcarriers. That's called the clustering because it's very hard to um, do one by one here, right? We just do the group by group, okay? That's what they do it, typically. Okay, now let's look at more detail about the scheduling systems. First of all, let's start from the basic one called the round robin scheduling. As I said, the round robin scheduling, the users are sequentially selected. Like uh, in manager example, I'm the manager, and I don't care, okay, who has a good performance and who has a good mood today. I don't care as a manager. I just say simply like, uh, today, user one, it's, it's your job to finish everything today. Tomorrow, user two, <clears throat> right? The after tomorrow, user three, something like this, right? Sequentially, I just switch to one user to another. Good thing about that, good thing, is that I, I need no information. Okay? I don't need to know the channel condition. I don't need to know anything. No feedback is necessary. Okay? I just simply um, take turns. Right? Absolutely no information is necessary. And, and a certain uh, notion, every user has an equal opportunity because I just do a take turns, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, things like that. So every user has an equal opportunity. Whether it's good or not, that's a different question. But everyone has an equal opportunity because I give the, you know, round robin. Uh, some bad things. Less capacity. Why is that? Why is it less capacity? Because accidentally I choose user one today, he was in a very bad mood, right? That actually happens, right? Because I didn't choose the best user at to, for the day. So definitely it's a less capacity. And this one is a user selection. Mathematically, it's simple as this. I is the user number, user index, for the time slot T, okay? Who's gonna select? That depends on the who selected in the previous time slot, plus one, simply. So the, in the previous time slot, like a time slot T minus one, T minus one, if the user five is selected, now you do plus one, user six is selected, okay? Something like this. But if you select the last guy, right, then you have to rotate and have to come back to one. Okay? It's like rotating. Simply, that's a round robin. Okay. Another extreme. Another extreme example. Now, let's think about the maximum SNR scheduling. This maximum SNR scheduling uh, is to choose the user with the highest SNR. So the user with the highest SNR, or we call that as a best user, this best user takes the given resources for that moment. Uh, this one is called the greedy algorithm, which means that the winner takes all, okay? In this case, um, in order to find out who is the best user, I have to know the channel condition. In the manager example, I have to know who has the good performance? User one has 
good performance. User 2 is the best performance. User 3 is very worst performance, something like that. I have to know the performance. And based on that information, I, I need to allocate the job. Okay? But I, I'm going to allocate all of my job to the best performing user only. Okay? Only the best performing user. Okay? That's the, this maximum SLR scheduling. Okay? In that case, of course, the, in the, considering the fading channel, right, the best user for today may not be the same as the best user for tomorrow. Okay? Right? Because the fading, think about fading channel, right? Today, user one is the best user for today. Right? I mean, talk, think about the manager example. Tomorrow, maybe user two is the best user. Okay? In here, right? Think about the fading channel. Maybe one time slot, user one has the best, best channel condition, but next time slot, maybe user two has the best condition. Okay? But anyway, um, I'm going to choose the user with the best or highest SNR for that moment. So every time slot, you basically choose the best one. So that's why we call the greedy algorithm. But however, in general, right, going back to this one, look at the user three is the closest distance, user two is far away. So once you do like a maximum SNR scheduler, right, then if you do that for a long time, long term, user three uh, is more selected than user two, right? Generally, I mean, on average, he's, he's better. He has a better performance, better um, channel quality than user two. Maybe at some point, if you do the for a long time, user two may be selected for a couple of times, but most of the time slot is taken by user three, which basically means that we have we have um, we have a fairness issue. Okay, we're going to talk about that fairness issue. Okay, but Nice thing about this maximum SNR scheduling or opportunistic scheduling is that maximum sum rate or maximum capacity is achieved because I'm always choosing the best one. Definitely the, that's the maximum capacity, right? You cannot do better than that because I always choose the best one. <coughs> sum rate means that <coughs> rate of all the, sum of the all the rates. Okay, that's a sum rate. Same as capacity. Uh, big problems of this scheduling system. First big problem, every user has to feedback its own channel state, not just once, but every time slot, basically. Okay? Every user. That way the scheduler collects all this information and have to decide, okay, now at this time slot, you are the best one, or you are the best one, right? So everyone has to report. Think about the manager example, right? In the manager example, all these five different people has to report to me, okay, I finished this much job today, I finished that much job today, right? They have to report to me. That way, I'll decide, I find out, okay, looks like this guy have a better performance than the other, looks like, right? They have to feedback, they have to report to me, otherwise, I, I have no idea, right? This one is a big, big problem, definitely, right? There are too much uh, channels, too much information. There are too many feedbacks. Okay, we're gonna uh, talk about this issue uh, in a minute. And uh, another problem is that the fairness issue. Okay, one user takes much, much more opportunity than another user. Okay, user selection is done this way. You see that the CIT, that's the capacity of the user I at time slot T. Okay. The user, for user I, the time slot T, uh, user I has this capacity, right? And amongst these users, we're going to choose the maximum user. Maximum, the, we're going to use with the maximum capacity. That's uh, my selection for time slot T. Okay? The third scheduling algorithm is called the proportional, proportional fair algorithm. Um, this scheduling algorithm is actually what is used in the cellular systems these days. Uh, although this is a little bit complex, uh, this, actually the previous two is like extreme. One is a very simple one, just do a round robin. 
nothing to do with the um, channel condition and things like that. Uh, it is very simple, but it, is, it has very low capacity. Second thing, has the maximum capacity, but it has its own problem, like a fairness issue. Okay? Fairness issues are like this, right? Since in this scenario, user 3 is close enough and user 2 is far away, this guy takes more time slot, which means that user 2 has very little access to the network. In that case, definitely this guy will complain, right? I'm paying the same amount as a uh, same monthly payment as him, then why not, you know, blocking me, something like this, right? He will complain. So therefore, the system, the network, should not um, make the uh, people complain like that, right? So they have to consider the fairness somehow. So therefore, they cannot do it this way because this way you have low capacity. You cannot do it this way truly because this one has a fairness issue. Therefore, um, they take somehow this algorithm. So let's look at this one. In this algorithm, you consider the capacity and fairness simultaneously. Okay. Um, how do you define the fairness? How do you define the user fairness? That's the um, yeah, that's kind of controversial. That's uh, um, that's not clear, but uh, we'll talk about it a little bit in later. But anyway, the good thing about this is that some user fairness is achieved. I said some, okay, which means that still it's a little bit vague. Okay, it's not clear. There is no exact definition of user fairness. Some people say that this is, this is the user fairness. Another people use that, okay, this is the more better way to define the fairness. Okay? But in this case, some fairness is achieved. And the bad thing is that still this one requires, the, requires each user to send the feedback because we use the channel state information. So the user has to feedback schedule the channel state information. And another uh, bad thing about this scheduler is that scheduler has more calculation. Okay? In order to consider the capacity and fairness at the same time, scheduler has to do more calculation. And this calculation has to be, has to be done in the scheduler. So let's look at this one. R means rate. I is a user. T is a time index. So this R, I, T basically means that the rate uh, for the user I at time slot T. Okay? So this basically means that the instantaneous rate and rate is the function of uh, SNR, or channel state. So for example, right, if the user 1 has, the, has a very good channel state, channel condition, then you have a good instantaneous rate because you have a good channel condition. Okay? So this one is the instantaneous rate. And the bottom here, you have a bar over over the R, right? You have a bar, means, meaning that this one is average, okay? And T, W is averaging window. Okay, let me go to the, my manager example, okay? That's how things work. I have a five different people working for me, and in order to decide who would be the best, I, uh, I'm sorry, not, not the best, but in order to um, do a scheduling based on the professional fairness, what I need to do is that I have to collect the history, okay? User one, if I look at the, um, the previous one month, okay, previous one month, looks like this is the average amount of job uh, the user one has done every day, okay? User two has done this, much, this, this little amount of job on average, okay? User three has this much of average, okay? Which means that user three in average sense, uh, user 3 has done this amount of job every day, okay, during the previous one month. This TW is the window for averaging, okay? I can uh, average over the one month, I can average over the one year, okay? That's the, this time window. So I select the time window, okay? And during that time window, I just uh, collect the, all the history, and based on that, I take the average, right, for each user, okay? Scheduler knows that and has to measure that, collect that. So what this basically shows you is that what is the instantaneous value 
depending on your average. That's what it means. So the, in the manager example, right? Let's say user three has the this much of average, which means that for the last one month, he has done this amount, this amount of job every day, right? In one month, on average sense. But today, uh, his condition, uh, he can do this amount, of, this amount of job, more than average. Then you have a large value of this, right? This is his average. He can do this much, okay? In, in average sense. But today, he, his condition is only this small, which means that today maybe he's not, he's not in good mood. Maybe he's in a bad mood, okay? He, in, in this scenario, which means that he has a, this user has, a, has a, a, a bad channel condition because channel condition always changes over time, right? Average sense, this is a channel condition, but at this moment, he has this channel condition, low channel condition, right? In that case, you have low rate, therefore you have a low value. So this condition is basically the, this is the ratio of your instantaneous compared to your own average. Okay? That's the value. And we're going to choose the maximum, choose the user with the maximum of this one. Okay? In that case, right, if you do this calculation, we are not selecting best user all the time. Okay? Maybe user one always is the best user. Okay? And user, maybe user five is always the worst user. Okay? In that case, in the maximum SNR scheduler, opportunistic scheduler, I always choose this guy because this guy is always the best. However, if you do this calculation, max, proportion, proportional, that's why we call this a proportional, proportional fair scheduler, then we are not selecting this guy always because he, um, the, his instantaneous uh, rate is compared with his own average and his own average is already high, right? So his instantaneous condition should be higher than his average. Same way, the worst user, I mean, his average rate is low, okay? So if his instantaneous condition is higher than his own average, then he maybe has a high probability to be selected. You see what I'm saying? So you basically are comparing with your own, okay? So in that sense, we can achieve some fairness. In earlier, in maximum SNR, there's no fairness, right? Because the manager, as a manager, I'm comparing all these users, so therefore, no fairness is achieved, but in this case, some fairness is achieved. So if you do this, right? <coughs> uh, yeah, that's what, what is happening. Uh, user selection is done this way. That's a profession fair. But there are a lot of calculations here, right? Because we have to calculate this one, the average. And you have to collect all these rates along this, um, over this window. Over this win window is typically pretty large. So you have to collect what was the rate over this whole range of time for every user. So therefore, it actually requires a lot of information. You have to do a lot of calculations. Uh, several issues, generally, several issues on scheduling. First one is the capacity. Of course, uh, this is the prime goal. You always, you want to achieve the maximum capacity, definitely. But at the same time, you have a fade feedback issue. Okay? The reason that we have a feedback issue is because that you want to consider the scheduler, you want to consider a channel state. Okay? That's the most important information for scheduler. So therefore, uh, in order to collect all the feedbacks, in order to collect the uh, channel state information, you have to use the feedbacks. So there are too many feedbacks. Simply speaking, there are too many. Okay, that's the feedback issue. Okay, so feedback issues and capacity issues and user fairness issues, all these are interrelated. Third one is a user fairness issue. As I just said, especially for heterogeneous users. The definition of heterogeneous user is that some user is close, another user is far away, okay? So we have not identical condition, right? Uh, it's a heterogeneous user condition. Uh, we have this problem, especially the user fairness. So these are, there are several other issues, but these are the most important issues. So let's look at the feedback issues first. This picture basically shows you a little bit um, expanded 
picture of the time slot. This is one time slot, and each time slot, simply speaking, you have two parts. First part is called the guard time, and followed by payload. So the reason we have a guard time is because that we want to make a user selection during the guard time. Okay? Using this guard time, we want to make a user selection, and then uh, in this payload duration, you want to do actual transmission. Okay? So guard time um, is like a control. Okay? You are not transmitting any data. This is like an um, um, additional um, necessary uh, part in order to make a user selection. So during guard time, you have to collect all the channel state from the users. Okay? User has to uh, send the feedbacks. So scheduler has to get all these feedbacks. And then quickly has to decide who is the user for this payload or for this time slot. So if you think about the professional fairness, right, then you do an averaging and you calculate the ratio. All these things has to be done in here in, during the guard time. Okay? And the payload is the transmission period. Uh, it, that's a time slot based system. In OFDMA based system, um, scheduler has to know also the channel quality per subcarriers. So there are more jobs in OFDMA. Now, this is one technique that I want to introduce you. So simply speaking, let's say we have 100 users. Okay? 100 users. In that case, scheduler has to collect 100 feedbacks every time slot. Okay? There are too many um, information, too many feedbacks. So the, definitely the first thing to think, first thing to say, think about is that how we can reduce the number of feedbacks. Okay? But you definitely don't want to sacrifice your performance. You still want to get a um, best performance possible, but you want to reduce the number of feedbacks. If there are 100 users, how can we reduce the number of feedbacks? Because that's a uh, that's typically that's, uh, that's not possible. 100 is feedback is not possible. So the one way to try is that now we can introduce a concept of threshold, like this one, threshold. So here's a picture. Uh, this is the same picture as before. This is a TDMA system. We have a time, and each one is a time slot. And uh, this is the channel condition um, for the user three. Right? Each one has its own fading. Now, for everyone, we introduce a threshold called the feedback threshold. And every user now knows this threshold. Okay? So what happened is that for every time, every time slot, now user one, in, in general, right, each user has to send a feedback to the space station, right? Containing its own channel state. But before that, each user now compare, compare its own channel state, its own channel condition with the threshold, okay? And now then if user one decide that, if user one determines that its own channel quality is actually higher than threshold, then go ahead and transmit and send, send the feedback. But if the channel quality, its own channel quality is even lower than threshold, then you don't transmit, okay? Don't transmit. So the, this uh, purple part right here, right? Let's look at the sec this first time slot. Um, in this first time slot, user three, the red user, right? The user three has higher channel quality than threshold. So therefore, this guy uh, send the feedback. But the blue one, and probably the uh, green one also, right? These two users decide that, oh, well, my channel condition is worse than threshold. OK, let's suppress my feedback transmission. Okay? So they do not transmit. In that case, within this time slot, you are not getting three feedbacks, you are getting only one. And just an example, right? Something like that. Okay? This is a very effective way of reducing the number of feedbacks. Okay, the reason behind this is that, let's say, going back to the original way, let's receive all the feedbacks from everyone. As a scheduler, I mean, the schedule typically, we're going to choose the best one anyway, right? So even though you send the feedback to me, 
if your channel condition is low enough, I'm not going to consider you anyway. Okay? That's why I select a certain threshold and saying that, okay, if your channel condition is lower than this, then you don't even bother to send the feedback because you are not going to be a part of the consideration anyway. You are already out, so you don't even have to send feedback. You see, you see what I'm saying? So that's the intention. Okay? So that's the, that's the very effective way. Uh, and here, I said a qualified user. Qualified user basically means that the user with the, with the high channel quality than the threshold. Okay? Only these users send the feedback, and uh, if you have a lower channel quality than threshold, then don't transmit. So by doing this, you can actually reduce the number of feedbacks significantly. Okay? Very effective. <clears throat> now going to the fairness issue. Uh, going back to this one. There may be another way to reduce feedback. It's up to, it's open for research. Okay? If you think about it and have a good idea, then it's always welcome okay? to investigate this issue. Uh, user fairness issue. As I said, fairness is defined, can be defined in many different ways. Maybe one way to define the fairness is that equal opportunity for every user. Sounds like it is a, a definition, a true definition of fairness, right? Because we have a five different people, I'm giving an equal opportunity for everyone. Sounds like that's a, a true fairness. However, that may not be the case. Okay? Do you think that's really fairness? I mean, in society, right? That concept is the same as maybe you are a millionaire, he is a poor guy, let's collect all the money, right? In government, as a government, we are going to redistribute all the money. Something like this, right? It's like a communist think, thinking, right? You see what I'm saying? So this may not be the right way to do it. Equal opportunity sounds good, but that's really not. Because we are thinking of the users with the different characteristics and different conditions, right? So we have to consider the different conditions and characteristics when we talk about fairness. So therefore, proportional fairness, is, people think that this one probably is a better definition of fairness. In this proportional fairness, since you, your rate and your condition uh, is compared with your own average, right? This one probably is a better fairness, better uh, definition of fairness. But still, this is open, okay? Some open. Okay, so that's the um, kind of fairness. But uh, what is important here is that when you have equal opportunity for every user, you definitely have a low capacity, of course, right? And this proportion fairness, with this uh, definition, using this definition, definitely you, you'll get a higher capacity than this one, but you definitely get a lower capacity than maximum SNR scheduler, which has no fairness. So if you sacrifice a fairness completely, you can maximize the capacity. So there's a trade-off between capacity and fairness, always. Okay? Always. Uh, yeah, so that's the thing. Uh, this one actually is uh, another one, pretty newer, newer um, research, uh, newer outcome. For heterogeneous users, right, which means that some users are close, another users are far away, some users are in, in good condition, another users are bad condition. Or always that's the typical scenario, right? In that scenario, um, CDF-based scheduling was proposed a couple of years ago, and uh, I think that was a pretty good um, approach. Um, this approach um, follows this way. Each user basically knows its own CDF, a cumulative distribution function. Uh, I mean, going back to this one, this one is like a similar approach. Each user knows its own average. Okay? And compared to its own average, uh, you, get, you, measure, you always measure the instantaneous channel quality or rate. Your in instantaneous one is compared to your own average. Okay? Similar concept, but in this case, you are not comparing with the average, 
but you are going to find out the location of your in instantaneous into the, your CDF picture. This is, let's say in the user one, you have this CDF picture, okay? Which means that you measure the channel quality for a long time, okay? Once you measure the long time, you can get the statistics, right? You get the sample of instantaneous channel quality for a long time, then you can draw the, you can find out the statistics, right? You collect the many samples. Find out the statistics and draw the CVF curve. And next time, whenever you measure another instantaneous channel quality, then you're gonna point, <clears throat> you're gonna see that where in the CDF your new instantaneous point located. Maybe this is a CDF for user one throughout the long-term measurement. And for this instant, my instantaneous channel quality comes here. For user two, again, this is the channel statistics, CDF for the user two, um, at this point, I have this instantaneous channel quality, right? So you basically find out where uh, in the CDF, where it belongs to, and then you read this value, CDF value. So user two, read the value B, user one, read the value A, and compare and, and send this information, A and B, to the scheduler, okay? Scheduler doesn't know anything about your CDF, doesn't have to know. The, each user finds out all this, each user just send A and B. And the scheduler, it's now, after that, it's up to scheduler. But typically, scheduler can choose the user with higher value, highest value of this one. This value, right, each of these value is sometimes called the quantile. Quantile. But mathematically, it is this way. <clears throat> this F, right? F is a CDF. I means user I. QI uh, is the channel quality here. Okay, user channel quality. So the Q, Q1 is this one. Q2 is this one, this value. This value is Q2. This value is Q1. Okay? Right? So this one, right, if you take the inverse inverse of CDF, then you read this value. So B equals to F2 inverse Q2, okay? This value is the inverse of CDF. Same way, A, this value, equals to F1 inverse Q1, okay? And you choose the maximum one out of that. That's uh, your selection. So why? I mean, why do you want to do this? Because think about this one. This one is a similar concept as a professional fairness, right? So this is the channel statistics for you, okay? You have this channel statistics. And now you are comparing instantaneous value, instantaneous channel state, based on your own statistics. Now it looks like that in this case, user two has pretty good instantaneous pretty good instantaneous value compared to your statistics. Generally, what is the average? Average is somewhere here, right? So earlier proportion fairness, you are comparing this one with only this point, just comparing these two. Okay, that's the proportion fairness. But in this case, uh, comparing just these two, by instead of just comparing these two, you are trying to locate where in the CDF you have, lo you have this point, okay? So uh, by looking at this one, now you see that um, how uh, this instantaneous channel quality is good compared to your own statistics, okay? And based on that, uh, you can uh, select the user with the best instantaneous channel quality compared to your own statistics. Typically these days, we combine this one into another issue. You have some issues in the, for example, uh, in the physical layer, for example, right? Let's think about the MIMO. Uh, if you remember that we briefly talked about this, but in MIMO case, right? You have two different users, or many, many different users, and each user have a multiple antennas, okay? But base station has only this much of antenna, okay? In that case, we, which we call as a multi-user system, right? Multi-user MIMO system, right? We have uh, multiple users, and each user has a MIMO, has a multiple antennas, 
base station also has multiple antennas. In this multi-user MIMO systems, you have a scheduling involved. Remember that? So this kind of concept, we are only talking about the scheduler today, but this scheduler concept is not just itself. It is combined with many other different issues. Okay? Combine the scheduler concept with the MIMO, combine with this one, with something else. Right? It's all combined. So part of this is called cross-layer. These days, you probably heard about cross-layer technology, cross-layer, blah, blah. This typically, the scheduler corresponds to like Mac layer. Some, not physical layer, but a little bit higher layer. Okay? Data link layer or Mac layer, things like that. Uh, whereas the OFDM, TDMA, MIMO, these things is a, a physical layer, right? So we combine these together, okay? Multiple layer together, that's cross layer, okay? Which means that some of the parameters in the physical layer will be used for scheduler, and some of the scale decision uh, impacted, impacts the physical layer parameter, things like that. Okay? That's cross layer. So it's uh, very important to um, understand these things. Any question? Yeah. So, so what is the use of uh, uh, the function ARG? Oh, ARG. Uh, ARG called is an uh, argument. Argument. Okay? So if you think about this one, let's say we have no argument, uh, ARG, right? Then what does that mean? You have this value, maybe this, for example, right? Uh, it is a maximize, you, it's a, it's a, the A is a parameter. So let's say we have two users. Then you have a R1, R1. Let's say we have one. And for user one, you calculate this one, and let's say you find out the value is one. For user two, I equal two, Let's, find, let's say you calculate this one, and user 2 finds out that uh, user 2 has this value of, let's say, 3. In that case, say you have no ARG, then what would be the value of this equation? 3, right? You are getting the value because uh, just maximization of this one, you, you get the maximum value of this one. But that's not what we want, right? What we want is that who has the maximum value, not the maximum value itself, right? We're going to use the who has the maximum. That's what we want, right? Not the maximum value itself. Therefore, we have ARG, ARG. ARG, once we put the ARG, that basically means that maximum value, the, the I of the maximum value. The I with the maximum value, OK? That's ARG. <coughs> Any other question? Okay, see you next week. <laughs>